Okay, good morning students. Let us begin our second semester's work with the paper on literary criticism and theory. This is the second paper in the second semester. We are dealing with the first part of literary criticism and theory. And the author that I chose to discuss uh, with you during this first session is Longinus. Okay? A Roman critic who lived around the time of the first century AD. Rome at that time was a culture and a civilization that was heavily influenced by Greek civilization. Before the beginning of the Christian era, we know that it was the Greek civilization that was in prominence. So powerful was this civilization, so impactful were its authors and other leaders that the next era had a very strong influence, um, an impact, uh, had a very strong, um, what shall you say, bearing of the Greek civilization. So with the beginning of the Christian era, with the AD and no Domini era, we have the rise of the Roman civilization. And in the, yeah, the beginning of the Roman civilization is marked by what is known as the Hellenistic period. Hellenism is a word that is used to describe a period that has a heavy influence of Greek culture and Greek civilization. So the Hellenistic period of Roman civilization, that is what we are discussing. And uh, most of the writers, you know, of early Rome, of the early Roman civilization, the Roman civilization, of course, was in prominence till the 4th or the 5th century AD. And the early writers of this period mostly wrote in Greek, even though Latin was definitely coming into the forefront. Uh, because of the Hellenism, because of the great respect that they had for Greek culture and civilization, most of the early works were written in Greek. And that is why the work of this critic, Longinus, is also, was originally written in Greek. It was later translated into Latin and then into other languages. And today we discuss it. Uh, in the light of the English translation, okay? Your syllabus expects you to look at three chapters of this treatise, which is available to us today only in the form of fragments. You know, because of the uh, later uh, eras that came into prominence after the Roman civilization, we know that, you know, many of the artifacts, many of the literary works of the previous uh, civilizations were destroyed due to various reasons, many of them natural. And like many other works, Longinus's treatise on the sublime is also uh, something that is handed down to us only in the form of fragments. But some parts of those fragments are indeed very significant. They express some of the most original ideas of literary criticism. And that is why centuries after he probably wrote, we still continue to discuss Longinus as an important critic. Of course, uh, the field of Greek criticism in your syllabus is uh, represented by both Plato and Aristotle. You have Plato's views as expressed in the Republic and Aristotle's views ex expressed in his poetics, right? So those are the two Greek critics. Among the Romans, I think you probably have Horace. Isn't that so? Do you, do you study Horace? Is he part of the syllabus? Horace has an important treatise called Ars Poetica, the art of poetry. And then we have Longinus, another Roman critic. I think these may be the two Roman critics that you have to study, even though there were others. Uh, one example would be Quintilin, uh, but 
you probably study only Horus and Longinus. And then you of course move on to English literary criticism. Uh, so yeah, to begin with Longinus, let me <clears throat> yeah. So this is the title Longinus. I'll come to the name Longinus. We only use the second name Longinus. What the first name is remains a matter of conjecture. I'll come to that. But the Greek title, I told you originally it was written in Greek. It is Peri Hypsos. P E R I H Y P S O U S. Peri Hypsos. Translated into English, that reads as on the sublime. Okay? So this is Longinus's work. I'll just give you an introduction, you know, to this work and what makes it unique and worth discussing in the late 21st century uh, or in the 21st century, many years after this was written. You know, uh, the field of literary criticism, at least till the point, time of Longinus, may be seen as broadly divided into two categories. You know, there were a few critics like Plato, for example, who believed that the chief aim of literature in particular and art in general is to instruct. It must make life better. Without that instructing quality attached to literature or to art in general, it has no value. You know, that was the stand taken by Plato. We are familiar with the harsh treatment that he gave to poets and who's, uh, on whom he closed the doors of his ideal republic. He said that poets are liars who, you know, deal with things twice removed from reality and so on. Plato had a very stern outlook on life and he believed that art has value only when it makes life better, only when it imparts lessons that can make life better. In other words, the chief purpose of art is to teach, to instruct. Plato has his own followers. Down the centuries, when you look at the field of literary criticism, you will find that there are many critics who um, follow in those tracks. They won't exactly say that it has to instruct and so on, but they are more concerned with those aspects of literature. For example, you know, later critics who dealt with uh, literature as a product of the social circumstances, the political critics, they would all follow in Plato's tracks. On the other hand, you have another school of literary criticism that is represented by people like Aristotle to begin with, who believe that the chief purpose of art and literature is to delight. So they're not so much concerned about the lessons that literature imparts. They are not so much concerned about literature having to make life better. As long as it delights you, as long as it gives you aesthetic pleasure, it is great. That was the stand taken by Aristotle and his followers. You know, you can think of the romantic critics, for example, later down in the line, they would also have said uh, more or less the same kind of thing about literature. Its aim is to delight. Now, I mean, they were not made concerned so much about the political aspect of literature or art in general. So, this is the kind of broad categorization. So, till the point of Longinus, you know, critics were more or less divided into the, these two categories. Those who want, uh, those who believe that literature should ideally teach, those who believe that literature should ideally delight. And then you have a third category of critics like Horace, for example, the Roman Horace would be a perfect example of a critic who believed that the best kind of literary work is one that both instructs and delights. You know, they gave importance to both these aspects. Other, it must also give you delight. It must please you. It must give aesthetic pleasure. So this was for long, you know, these were the major concerns of literature. But... Longinus was probably the first one who turned the direction of literary criticism to something entirely new. 
he talked about something that had never been discussed in literary or uh, yeah, such scholarly circles. He said that the greatest quality of literature or art is its sublimity. What is sublimity? Sublimity is the ability of a work to transport you, to move you to a higher realm of experience. You know, it takes you to a sublime level. So he said, great literature may teach, it may instruct, it may please, it may do both, fine. But what makes it truly great is not any of these qualities, but its ability to transport you, its ability to take you to a sublime height altogether. Sublime, what does that word mean? Something that is very lofty, something that is very, you know, of a very, very high order. It is not ordinary. It is far above the ordinary. And great works of literary literature, according to Longinus, are those which have the ability to give you that kind of uh, life-changing experience. When you read that kind of a literary work or when you watch that kind of a literary work of a work of art, it leaves you a changed person. You can never be the same again. So that is what he conveys using the word sublimity. Okay, so in a sense that is what Longinus says and that is what makes him unique. Before we come to that and before we discuss the chapters that are prescribed for our study, it is only right that we talk about this person. Who is this Longinus? We know uh, that he lived somewhere around the first century AD in Rome, in the newly emerging Roman civilization. But as many of the other writers of his time did, he too wrote in Greek. And that is why this tract, which is now available to us only in the form of fragments, is, was originally titled Peri Hypsos, which means on the sublime. And it remains one of the great works of literary criticism. The earliest surviving manuscript from a, probably the 10th century, first printed in 1554, ascribes it to a person named Dionysius Longinus. So there are certain tracts which have that as the first name, Dionysius Longinus. But someone, some other scholars, um, you know, noticed that probably there was a line or so in between indicating that it may be either Dionysius or Longinus. From that, it is clear that, you know, as with Homer, you know, we talk about the Homeric question. There is a great deal of uncertainty regarding the real identity of Homer. Who was Homer? What was his real name? Was Homer the real name? Or was there just one person or many others who were known as Homer? Was it a, an honorific title that was given to a great scholar who could recite lines of poetry? You know, such questions remain regarding Homer. That is what is known in literary circles as the Homeric question. Now, that kind of question uh, persists persist with regard to Longinus too. Who this Longinus was remains a mystery. Some critics believe that it may be a person named Dionysius of Halicarnassus, or it may be uh, whose real name was Cassius Longinus. I mean, or, or in, another person, you know, they believe that it may be either Dionysius of Helicarnassus or it may be a person named Cassius Longinus. You know, there are a few references to a, a, a scholar named Cassius Longinus in a few Roman um, works. Or it may be the great Roman writer Plutarch. Probably he chose the name Longinus. Again, it is a matter of conjecture. We really do not know who the real Longinus was. But there is no denying the fact that there was somebody who wrote the work called On the Sublime. Other in the Namalka Murvenoda Kittila, but whatever remains remains unique and precious, and we may uh, accept uh, for want of any other solid, more solid evidence that it was written by a person named Longinus. Atra Manslakyamadi, Avada Pera Pradhanam. So uh, that is why 
you know critics sometimes also call this person pseudo longinus pseudo endu parna false ennaanu appo ed longinus aanu ariyadeyana literary circles la he is also known as pseudo longinus that is anyway um, not so important for us what is more important is the fact that there is this trait is called on the sublime we are almost certain that it dates from around the first century ad it was originally written in greek and it was um, uh, written by a, a, a rhetorician a scholar who probably lived in sicily that part of rome about a third of this manuscript is lost what we have was only one third of it and the whole of it is in the form of a kind of discussion that he has with his student probably terentianus aa perum nammal orkunnathu nalladayirikkum so i'll just i've just given a definition of sublimity in this uh, slide here longinus defines sublimity in literature as the echo of greatness of spirit that is the moral and imaginative power of the writer that pervades a work you know that power that, that a great writer has because of which any work written by that writer will be of great moral strength of great imaginative power but beyond all that will be such that it can transport you to a new level of experience so again for the first time uh, one may say that uh, he, here was a critic who um, was discussing the author you know that's a very important turning point in literary criticism later schools of literary criticism particularly the romantic school of literary criticism gave a lot of importance to the author the biography of the author biographical criticism is an important kind of literary criticism you may trace the beginnings of that probably to longinus otherwise we are familiar with aristotle we are familiar with plato before that you know they were all concerned only with literary works aristotle's poetics for example is largely concerned with drama that existed before his time he mainly focused on the plays of sophocles you know when he writes about those plays when he defines tragedy tragedy is the imitation of an action and nokku parana nammal padikkunnundallo when he talks about the tragic hero and so on he focuses only on the play itself he never talks about sophocles sophocles eldiyadana ellavarkum ariyam but you know how sophocles's life was reflected in this how sophocles's spirit was reflected in this angane oru paramarsham evideyo illa so the author was not of great concern to literary criticism till then longinus was the first critic who gave importance to the personality of the author that is a first in literary criticism it is for this reason that very often he is cons considered to be the first romantic critic or the first critic in you find in whom you find traces of romantic criticism or romanticism in the venamengil pariya we'll discuss more of that in the uh, uh, you know later uh, yeah so this work uh, on the sublime is written as a kind of epistolary piece it may be it may have been a letter or it may have been a discussion because edakedak you find my dear terentianus my dear terentianus terentianus is the name of the student so uh, he was either having a discussion with him or writing a letter to him that is why it is called epistolary piece and um, what uh, happens in the in this rather long treatise of which we only now have a few parts Uh, he is discussing the work of many writers uh, some thing around um, 50 authors or so with a great deal of attention given to the works of homer homer is a writer whom he holds in very high esteem and whose works he considers to be perfect examples of sublimity so he uh, examines the work of some 100 or some 50 ancient authors using the lens of the sublime are their works sublime enough are these authors um, enriched with the kind of spirit that can uh, give readers the feel of sublimity that is what longinus examines 
So, uh, sublim the sublime, which Longinus defines as the writer's ability through feeling and words to reach beyond the realm of the human condition into greater mystery. You know, it takes you to a higher level from your ordinary, ordinary level of experience. When you see this book, when you touch it, for example, there is a very physical perception that you have. But when it is a great work, suppose this is King Lear by uh, Shakespeare, and I read it and I become a different person altogether. I mean, I'm, I'm not looking at that as a mere book. I'm not reading the lines as I would read the lines of a newspaper. You know, it is something beyond that. Yeah, so uh, in the slide, I have mentioned how Longinus, you know, became the first of uh, the critics who looked at literary criticism through a new angle altogether. So till the time of Longinus, literary criticism was one that, something that insisted that poetry should either instruct or delight or instruct and delight. Uh, on the other hand, they also talked about prose. Prose should persuade. Uh, Korean literary critics and they who talked about the power of the rhetorical power of prose, how it can persuade and so on. So poetry should either instruct or delight or instruct and delight. Prose should persuade. Ida Irunu, literary criticism. It was Longinus who first pointed out that great works were not great merely because of these qualities. E qualities illa and Allah. He gives attention to these qualities, but these are not the most important qualities. It is the sublimity factor which is more important. So, what is this sublimity? As I told you, it is a very high level of experience. And it consists in a certain distinction and consummate excellence in expression. There's something unique, something distinct, something that is consummate. You know, it is not easily definable. The effect of a sublime passage, he says, is not to convince the reason of a reader, but to transport the reader out of himself. It is not to simply teach the reader something. It is not to simply give a kind of pleasure to the reader. It is not simply to convince him or to persuade him, but to transport him out of himself. Other than a sublimity. If a great literary work has that ability, then you may consider it as a sublime work. So it is by its moving power that literature attains to sublimity. So throughout the treatise, uh, he, he tells his student Terentian is about those works which have sublimity. Those writers who are capable of giving their readers sublime experience and those who do not have that power. And it is uh, in chapter 7 to 9 that you come to some of the most important points that he discussed. You know, at the crux of this treatise, one may say, is the section that deals with the sources of the sublime. He identifies five sources of the sublime. We will discuss that. That is in the ninth chapter uh, that he talks about the five sources of the sublime. So it is by its moving power that literature attains sublimity. Yeah. So before I come to uh, a detailed discussion of the sources of the sublime, the five sources of the sublime, according to Longinus, are number one, grandeur of thought. Grandeur of thought. That is, it must be thought of a very high, grand nature, not ordinary thought. Angane ullo or literary work, sublime alengil great ullo. Now, among the five sources of the sublime, the first and the second. He considers those as the natural sources of the sublime. Adaida, you should be naturally endowed with these. Number one, grandeur of thought, G R A N D E, you are. Number two, capacity for strong emotion. Capacity for strong emotion. So, only if a writer has both these naturally acquired qualities will the writer be capable of creating a work of sublimity. Grandeur of thought, capacity for strong emotion. I will explain these 
uh, but you may write down. Number three is three, four, and five are um, you know those which can be acquired, those which you can develop later. Number three, appropriate use of figures. Figures on the Bernal, figures of speech and okay, the literary techniques that a writer uses. Appropriate use of figures is number three. Number four is nobility of diction. Using the right kind of words, choosing the best words, nobility of diction. And finally, dignity of composition. Dignity of composition. You know, put... Uh, uh, putting the words together in the most dignified nature, in the most elevated nature, in the best order, the best words in the best order in the Pariyam. So the five sources of the sublime, grandeur of thought, capacity for strong emotion, appropriate use of figures, nobility of diction and dignity of composition. You should be born with those. These are innate or natural qualities. The third, fourth and fifth sources are things which you can develop or acquire later. But, uh, you know, he says that even if you are not born with those first two uh, qualities, but you can still develop those. You know, he's telling Terentianus, a writer can develop these, provided the writer spends good enough time with great writers. Homer ne pole works vai Suppose, uh, you know, you've spent enough or a great deal of time with these great uh, works that are sublime, you can gradually make up for these qualities. sublimity attain the literary work. Grandeur of thought and capacity for strong emotion. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll explain these, uh, uh, a few sentences I'll read from Longinus' treatise to help you understand better regarding grandeur of thought. You may just note down the points here or here and there. Uh, you know, sublimity is the echo of greatness of soul. I'll send you uh, some photocopy, okay? Don't, you don't, uh, you just note down points. You don't need to write down some, uh, the, the entire sentence. It is impossible for those whose lives are full of mean and servile ideas and habits to produce anything that is admirable and worthy of any mortal life. It is only natural that great accents should fall from the lips of those whose thoughts have always been deep and full of majesty. Um, yeah. Stately thoughts belong to the loftiest minds. Stately thoughts belong to the loftiest minds. Yeah, and then he gives examples from Homer, from Demosthenes and so on uh, to prove how they were really people who were capable of grand thought. And grandeur of thought signifies, you know, they, uh, you know they, their literary works therefore signify a transport caused by the noblest thoughts finding their natural expression in the noblest language. Literature that takes such hold on us is nurtured on whatever is noble and sublime in life and literature. It has an elevating effect both morally and artistically. So that is grandeur of thought. Now capacity for strong emotion. You know the, the, the writer must be uh, capable of responding emotionally in a very strong way to situations, to life and so on. Angane or sensitive Okay, talks about the um, very powerful role played by the emotions. Uh, yeah, he says, I would confidently affirm that nothing makes so much for grandeur as true emotion in the right place, for it inspires the words with a wild gust of mad enthusiasm and fills them with a divine frenzy. So again, he gives examples from ma many writers to prove that, you know, they were writers who were capable of responding emotionally to situations. He talks about, for example, the description of the battle scenes in uh, the Iliad uh, of Homer, the, the descriptions of the many adventures of Odysseus in 
the odyssey of Homer, all of these are capable because Homer as a person was capable of powerful emotions. So either and one are the natural uh, acquisitions that a, great, a, a truly great writer should have. Then you have, uh, you know, things that they can acquire with practice. You may, by using appropriate figures of speech, achieve sublimity in writing. Of the artistic aids to sublimity, the figures of speech occupy the largest space and a great deal of the treatise is actually explanation of the various figures of speech. Pala figures of speech are the parayananda, you know, um, um, I'll just mention a few. One is rhetorical question. You know, a rhetorical question is a question that does not require an answer. Sometimes, you know, great speeches will have that kind of a question. Will you a question, Chodke? Is this my country? Is this the country that I was born to live in? In the Chodke, it does not require an answer, but it is a very powerful way of rousing the audience. Angane a rhetorical question. Ascendant and hyperbate and periphrases, you know, these are all examples. Um, yeah, uh, um, that is sometimes hyperbolic or exaggerated expression. In certain situations, it may be useful to convey sublimity. And you have plenty of examples again that he gives. Hyper, hyper, hyper baited, for example, is an inversion of the normal order. Sadharna Ridil Parinadin Pagaram Adine invert, you know, the word order when it is inverted. It is a figure of speech which is called hyper baited, and um, it is something that will catch the attention of the, uh, uh, the readers and it will naturally convey a very powerful impression. Mm. Yeah, periphrases similarly is a very roundabout way of saying things. Periphrases, P E R I P H R A S I S. Yeah, so these are just a few examples. Hyperbaton, periphrases, rhetorical question. Among the many that he gives. Then you come to the third, I'm sorry, the fourth source, which is nobility of diction. That is the proper choice of words and the use of metaphors and ornamented language. Words, when suitable and striking, have a moving and seductive effect upon the reader and are the first things in a style to lend it. You know, later Wordsworth would say the same thing about poetic diction. The right kind of words, that is very important for sublimity. Yeah, so he explains that also in and finally, he comes to the last source of the sublime, which is dignity of composition. Using all of these, you have to put, uh, you know, everything in the right order. Um, yeah, if the elements of grandeur, if you have all the four, grandeur, for, grandeur of thought and the capacity for strong emotions and the figures of speech, you choose the right words. In spite of having all of these, if they are not put in the right order, then sublimity will be scattered. If the elements of grandeur be separated from one another, the sublimity is scattered and made to vanish. But when they are organized into a compact system uh, and encircled in a chain of harmony, then they gain a living voice by being merely rounded into a period. Then they will have a very powerful effect. A harmonious composition alone sometimes makes up for the deficiency of the other elements. The last one alone, you know, that perfect kind of composition that alone can create, create, create greatness in a work of uh, art according to Longinus. So these are the five sources of the sublime. Even day he talks about a few things that writers should avoid. You know, he talks about uh, another writer, or a Cecilius in the Parnora writer, Cecilius Cassius. Cecilius, C A E C I L I U S Cassius. C S S I U S. So, you feel that probably uh, a person named Cassius, Cecilius Cassius, 
had made some remarks on the sublime and Longinus is correcting those remarks in his discussion or letters to um, uh, Terentianus, his student, he says, Sicilianus, Sicilius Cassius was wrong. So that is what the whole treatise is about. So, you know, like great works of literary criticism, very often you find that they are all responses to some other great work of literary criticism. For example, Shelley's defense of poetry. It's an important work of romantic criticism. It was a kind of answer that he gave to another critic named Thomas Love Peacock. Works, many great literary critical works are responses to earlier works. So, um, Longinus' treatise was probably a, re a response to the observations on sublimity made by a person. We do not know anything about that person named Cecilius Cassius. Okay? Yeah, so in that context, he talks about three things that writers should avoid. One is turgidity. Uh, turgidity, Adana Chalapam, he talks it about tumidity, T U M I D I T Y. What is that? It is a kind of very um, timid kind of expression uh, or a dull, a very, uh, in the paria, very ordinary way of expressing things. That is turgidity. On the other hand, you may have purility. What is purility? Uh, it is a kind of very pom bomb, uh, pompous style. About other, other extreme. So, turgidity, purility, P U E R I L I T Y. These are things that have to be avoided. Similarly, parenthesis, P A R E N T H E S E S. That is when passion is out of place when there is unrestrained passion these are all things that have to be avoided this is an earlier chapter learned for in the number the seven to nine lala purchase this is an important section in the treatise yeah and then he talks about another important point uh, the rest of the seven to nine cardinal pinne the treatise is full of examples quoted from homer sappho and other great Greek writers, Elam Greek writers, and then in that section, there is an important distinction that he makes between the true sublime and false sublime. Other number, as readers, we have to be uh, cautious of that. The same elements of true sublime, he says, may obstruct and cause false, false sublime if they are not well handled by virtue of nature and sincerity. So. If five sources of the sublime ubayogicitta, nalla reedil kondu verinadhanyana true sublime. Sometimes they may be wrongly used and the reader may be misled. That is what he describes as the false sublime. Yeah, so I have given the link in this slide. You can click on it and read, uh, see the entire uh, uh, treatise. You don't need to read. Just to get a few extra points. But in the remaining slides, I have put up the text of the three chapters that are prescribed for our study. 7, 8 and 9. Okay. In the 7th chapter, the most important point, I have highlighted it in red here, what he says is, um, yeah, uh, consider those examples of sublimity to be fine and genuine, which pleases all and always. That is, sublime works or sublimity works that have sublimity will please everyone and will always please everyone across time across age ages across across cultures the truly great sublime works will delight will transport you so those are the examples of sublimity are those which please all and please always in the eighth chapter yeah eighth chapter learn actually he shows us yeah uh, five principal sources of sublimity. First and most important is the power of forming great conceptions. You must remember that it is translated, you know, from the Greek. There are many translations available. So, words For example, 
grandeur of thought in that one author par in that but someone else may say, say the power of forming great conceptions conception is nothing but thought great thought in the capability are number one secondly vehement and inspired passion great passion these two are the innate qualities natural inborn qualities inborn third one the due formation of figures so appropriate figures figures of speech techniques and so on four noble diction that is the choice of words use of metaphors and elaboration of language explaining things using the right words and finally dignified and elevated composition so these are the five sources of the sublime Uh, a few examples he gives in chapter eight itself. Please do read. Okay, these and in chapter nine, uh, he goes on to discuss uh, many more works where you have uh, instances of great sublimity, mainly from Homer's works. Odyssey, uh, Iliad, the like. Kore quotations are from uh, Homer's works. So that's what you have in the lengthy ninth chapter. Please do read it. Yeah. Okay. So please do read the three chapters specifically and the whole if you do feel like it. Okay, so shall I close my discussion on uh, Longinus? I hope Longinus, as a critic, is somebody that you can relate to. Uh, you know, one of the first critics who gave importance to the personality of the writer and who also discussed an important term like sublimity, something that had not been discussed till then in the circles of. literary criticism so that is his uniqueness and for which reason he is called um, you know the romantic the first romantic critic yeah okay